I'll make several brief statements and then endeavor to explain their meaning and, and significance. When a person is perceptively understood, he finds himself coming in touch with a wider range of, of his experiencing. This gives him an expanded referent to which he can turn for guidance in understanding himself and in directing his behavior. If the empathy has been accurate and deep, he may also be able to unblock a flow of experiencing and permit it to run its uninhibited course. Well, you may well want to ask me, what, what do I mean by those statements? I believe they'll be clearer if I present an excerpt from a recorded interview with a woman in the later stages of therapy. This, is, this too is an excerpt I've used before, but it's particularly appropriate here. A middle-aged woman is exploring some of the complex feelings that have been troubling her. She says, I have the feeling it isn't guilt. She begins to weep. Of course, I mean... I can't verbalize it yet. It's just being terribly hurt. And the therapist says, it isn't guilt except in the sense of being very much wounded somehow. She continues weeping. It's, you know, often I've been guilty of it myself, but in later years, when I've heard parents say to their children, stop crying, I've had a feeling, a, a hurt, as though well, why should they tell them to stop crying? They feel sorry for themselves. And who can feel more adequately sorry for himself than the child? Well, that's sort of what I mean, as though I mean, I thought that they should let him cry and feel sorry for him too, maybe, in a rather objective kind of way. Well, well that's, that's something of the kind of thing I've been experiencing. I mean now, just right now. The therapist says, that catches a little more of the flavor of the feeling that it's almost as if you're really weeping for yourself. Yeah. And again, you see, there's conflict. Our culture is such that, well, I mean, one doesn't indulge in self-pity. But this isn't, I mean, I feel it doesn't quite have that connotation. It may have. The therapist says, you sort of think there's a cultural objection to feeling sorry about yourself. And yet you feel the feeling you're experiencing isn't quite what the culture objects to either. And then, of course, I've come to see and to feel that over this. See, I've covered it up, and she bursts into tears, but I've covered it up with so much bitterness, which in turn I had to cover up. That's what I want to get rid of. I almost don't care if I hurt. The therapist, you feel it here at the basis of it as you experience it is a feeling of real tears for yourself. But that you can't show. You mustn't show. So that's been covered by bitterness that you don't like, that you'd like to be rid of. You almost feel you'd rather absorb the hurt than to feel the bitterness. And what you seem to be saying quite strongly is, I do hurt and I've tried to cover it up. The client says, I didn't know it therapist says, like a new discovery, really. And the client says, I never really did know. But it's, you know, it's almost a physical thing. It's a sort of, as though I were looking within myself at all kinds of nerve endings and bits of things that have been sort of mashed. And the therapist says, as though some of the most delicate aspects of you, physically almost, have been crushed or hurt. And she says, yes. And you know, I do get the feeling, oh, you poor thing. But here I think it's clear that empathic therapist responses encourage her in the wider exploration of and closer acquaintance with the visceral experiencing that's going on within. She's learning to, to listen to her guts, to use that inelegant term, she has expanded her knowledge of the flow of experiencing within herself. And here, too, we see again how this unverbalized visceral flow is used as a referent. How does she know that guilt is not the word to describe her feeling? By turning within, taking another look at this reality, this palpable process which is taking place, this experiencing. 
I think in the example I was giving that uh, it's pretty clear that when a person is perceptively understood and he comes, in this case she, comes in touch with a wider range of her experiencing, is able to use that more as an expanded referent and is able, and this is I think a concept that's a little difficult to catch, is able to let a blocked experiencing carry itself through to its to its real conclusion. And now I'm coming to the conclusions that I want to make in regard to the paper. Really sort of two concluding sections. Um, I want now to back off and give a rather different perspective on the significance of empathy. We can say that when a person finds himself sensitively and accurately understood, he develops a set of growth-promoting or therapeutic attitudes toward himself. Let me explain what I mean. First of all, the, the non-evaluative and acceptant quality of the empathic climate enables him, as we've seen, to take a prizing, caring, even loving attitude toward himself. And second, being listened to by an understanding person makes it possible for him to listen more accurately to himself with greater empathy toward his own visceral experiencing his own vaguely felt meanings. But his greater understanding and prizing of himself opens up to him new facets of his experience which become a part of a more accurately based self. His self is now more congruent with his experiencing. Thus he has become, in his attitudes toward himself, more caring and acceptant more empathic and understanding, more real and congruent. But these three elements are the very ones which both experience and research indicate are the attitudes of an effective therapist. So we are perhaps not overstating the total picture if we say that an empathic understanding by another has enabled the person to become a more effective growth enhancer a more effective therapist for himself. Consequently, whether we are functioning as therapists, as encounter group facilitators, as teachers, or as parents, we have in our hands, if we're able to take an empathic stance, a powerful force for change and growth. I think its strength needs to be appreciated. And then finally, I want to put all that I've said into a larger context because I've been speaking only of the empathic process, it may seem that I regard it as the only important factor in growthful relationships. I would not wish to leave that impression. I'd like briefly to state my views as to the significance of what I see as the three attitudinal elements making for growth in their relationship to one another. In the ordinary interactions of life, between sex partners, between teacher and student, employer and employee, or between colleagues, it's probable that congruence is the most important element. Such genuineness involves letting the other person know where you are emotionally. It may involve confrontation and the owned and straightforward expression of both positive and negative feelings. Thus, congruence is a basis for living together in a climate of realness. But in certain other special situations, caring or prizing may turn out to be the most significant. Such situations include nonverbal relationships, parent and infant, therapist and mute psychotic, and the like. Caring is an also an attitude which is known to foster creativity, a nurturing climate in which delicate and tentative new thoughts and productive processes can emerge. And then, in my experience, there are other situations in which the empathic way of being has the highest priority. When the other person is hurting 
confused, troubled, anxious, alienated, terrified, when he's doubtful of his own self-worth, uncertain as to his identity, the gentle and sensitive companionship of an empathic stance, accompanied, of course, by the other two attitudinal elements, provides illumination and healing. In such situations, it is, I believe, the most precious gift that one can give to another. <laughs>